We're back with Coach's Corner. James and I are here to answer all of your specific questions. Yeah, we've got another varied set of questions this week that we've taken from the comments below our videos. And you can leave your questions in the comments below this video or any of our videos using the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. And we could be answering your question next week in the GTN Coaches Corner. So let's get to the questions. Yeah, to kick us off, we've got this one from Michael Geno. Would it be fair to say if you step up to half iron, you should get a TT bike or at least clip-on aero bars. Now, we've touched on something similar to this in a recent Coach's Corner, but it sounds like you are currently on the road bike. You don't have the option of a TT bike. And there's a lot to take in. I know we're both on slightly different camps with this, but I think you'd be more on the side of the road bike if, you, if it's something that someone is coming from and they're going to their first 70.3. Well, yeah, if you're going for your first 70.3 and you're not sure you're going to carry on with this, a TT bike is a big investment to just Huge. do one 70.3. In fact, it's a big I'll, investment full stop. Well, yeah, I would probably actually suggest don't do it. If, if you're not sure you're going to do many of these or you might just do one and done, uh, you definitely should just do it on your road bike. You'll be fine and you'll enjoy it. Uh, but if you are taking this seriously, you're going to do a few more uh, or you're even stepping up to an Ironman, uh, then a TT bike is going to make such a big difference to your bike time and probably also your bike enjoyment. It's a long time to be sitting up on a road bike with no drafting uh, without an aero bike. So then you maybe do want to look at getting a TT bike. Having said that though, if you are on your road bike, then clip-on aero bars are probably the best bet. Uh, they're the best of both worlds, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, you're not going to be sitting up the whole time like you are on a road bike stuck with nowhere to move, uh, but you're also not spending an absolute fortune on a TT bike. Yeah, I think you'll see at the 70.3, you'll see loads of road bikes with clip-on TT bars. And it's just part of that journey of triathlon. You go from your road bike and you start sort of getting a little bit more aero and getting used to riding on the bars. It's still a very different position to a TT bike, but you're getting sort of used to that. And actually, I did my first 70.3 with clip-on aero bars, and I would suggest practicing them for plenty of time before. I got given them on the Thursday afternoon and my half was on the weekend. And I did sort of a little tentatively was still learning how to get on these bars during the race, which was interesting. Interesting, but you're totally fine and I think the, the first thing is to really just you know, work on your bike fitness because that will make the biggest difference initially is making sure you've put the, the work and the time in with those bike miles to, to get you through that race and then with those clip on aero bars you might want to tweak your position a little bit once you've got them but bear in mind that if you're doing more of your riding, riding as a road bike you, yeah, it's a compromise between moving the saddle, but I think that leads us on to our next question a little bit, so I won't touch on that too much. Yeah, well, let's move straight on to our next okay, question yeah, let's then. let's do yeah. it. <laughs> it's Austin Reese, and he says, will aero bars do the trick if I don't want to get a TT buck? Or do I need to get a TT saddle also if, I, if I'm putting aero bars on? Well, we literally just covered the aero bars. Exactly. Uh, yes, do use clip-on aero bars. They will do the trick if you don't want to get a TT buck. They will not turn your road bike into a TT buck, let's be clear. They will improve your road bike's aerodynamics somewhat for non-drafting events, you will still be in a road bike position. And a road bike position is not just where your elbows are or your arms are on the handlebars, it's also your saddle position. A TT bike saddle is much further forward than a road bike position, which allows you to get into that more aerodynamic position on the front end. Uh, so putting clip-ons on a road bike doesn't change the whole bike geometry. Uh, it does just make you a little bit more error on your road bike. Having said that though, uh, yes, you can absolutely uh, use your road bike as a TT bike or a triathlon bike with some clip-ons on. And do you need a TT saddle? Well, again, yes and no. You can definitely get away with just a road saddle. Uh, but you may not be as comfortable. TT saddles are designed for your hips to roll a little bit further forward and be in that more aerodynamic position, that more aggressive position that TT bikes have. Uh, and if you're putting clip-ons on, on your road bike, hmm, you might want to get that more comfortable saddle for that position. Yeah, I mean, road bike saddles have obviously normally a longer nose and the, the weight is designed to go through your seat bones. So if you are in that forward position, the weight is suddenly moving much further forwards and it can put pressure on the sensitive area. So TT saddles are quite often split nose, which will relieve that pressure. Some will even have some slightly grippier parts. If you're in a wet tri suit, for example, it just helps you to hold that position on the bike. And you might even, I uh, touched on the end of the last question, want to slightly raise your saddle and you can bring it forward a little bit it's not putting it into that TT position like James was talking about but it's just making you slightly more able to benefit and make the most of having your bars down in front of you so it's going to take a bit of tweaking it might be worth getting someone to have a look externally and just sort of see how your setup is 
but it also will depend on how much time you're going to be using that bike as a triathlon bike and how much time as a road bike. That said, I have actually seen people at my club who use split nose sort of triathlon TT saddles on their road bikes because they find them more comfortable anyway. So it could be something that, that's worth trying. Definitely feels like we get into race season because again, more and more race related questions uh, like this next one. Uh, Steve Nagel asks, try suit or cycle run gear? Pretty simple question. That's about as short as our questions get on here. Uh, well, well, you've got a simple answer for it. Well, uh, I guess a tri suit is the way to go, isn't it? I mean, a tri suit is very practical for a triathlon. Basically, you wear the same thing swim, bike, run, don't have to change. It's moisture wicking. You're not going to feel wet or sticky or carry an extra weight or anything, uh, and you're really comfortable. But there are a few caveats to that. It can be a little bit more tricky to go to the bathroom, for example, uh, if that's an issue. For a, a shorter course race, it's not entirely necessary. Uh, you may be more comfortable in what you trained in, which is cycle gear and run gear, and maybe time is not that much of an issue and you can spend that time in transition. Obviously, a, tri a tri suit is gonna be a lot quicker in transition. There's nothing to change. You literally are changing your helmet or your bike shoes or your run shoes. You're not changing anything else, whereas changing into your cycle gear is gonna take a bit of time in transition. But if that's not an issue, for you then wear what's most comfortable for you it's it's not rocket science when we were when i started out everyone wore two-piece tri suits everyone there was there was no such thing as a one-piece tri suit uh, and there was no such thing as sleeves either they were all cut off on the arms that the sleeves were were a new invention uh, maybe i'm giving away my age <laughs> let me to keep running speedos are you back in <laughs> no, that I wasn't era that old i'm not that old <laughs> speedos in a singlet no that's more that's that's, that's before my time i mean thankfully. i know some people are intimidated by the thought of going and swimming cycling and running in this sort of lycra onesie which in theory is what a tricycle is but you will find when you go to triathlon don't know if you've done many before but you will feel quite normal dressed yeah, like that. you will it's... feel normal because you're surrounded by weirdos. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and you can maybe see if someone's got one you can borrow, if there's a tri club near you, if you just want to try one out. Um, and then there's a bit of a compromise as well. I personally, when I first started, I was a bit like, oh, I'm not sure I want to wear this one piece. I might need to dip to the bathroom and went for um, triathlon shorts or sort of a, a basically a quick drying material that was tri specific shorts, wore a cycle jersey and then wore a running vest. And that transition took no time at all, but it was for a long distance and I wanted to make sure I was comfortable. But now I'm, very much you know a transit transition to tri suits and see their benefits too so it's a personal personal yeah. there are no rules it's up to you tri suits were designed for triathlons for a reason though yeah. they're pretty practical okay on to our next question and that's uh swimming related uh king king craig hmm, i wonder what he's king of he says does using flippers work your legs in different ways uh well <laughs> well, to start with, I'm by by the word flippers. I just want to clarify because flippers to me, I sort of have this idea of um, diving, diving those big yeah. long flippers. Now, those we use your legs in yeah, different ways. They will do, and they're not going to be specific to swimming, and probably not really very good for going to training your local pool because you're probably going to take people out as you're trying to trying to manoeuvre with them. So let's move on to what are normally called swimming fins, and they actually the swimming specific ones are not going to be much longer than your feet. It's more the actual action that it helps with, and the answer is is yes, they will change how your, well, they'll accentuate how your legs work. Yeah, the point of, change. the reason that they're so short, not like those diving ones, is those diving ones will completely change the muscles that you use. It allows you to use your hamstrings, it allows you to use your calves. Whereas swim flippers, swim fins, swimming training fins uh, are, designed specifically to train your swim kick, the kick that you're going to use without your fins on. So if they completely change the muscles you're using, they would be pretty pointless for their job. So they are designed to train those hip flexors, those glutes, those things that you're going to use when you're actually swimming. Uh, they just basically like putting paddles on your arms are going to make your arms work a little bit harder. Those fins are going to make your leg legs work a little bit harder. What they use for mostly in swimming is not actually training per se, not actually trying to make your legs stronger. It's more to get your body in a better position when you're training so that you can get used to that position for when you're racing and you can stay in that position. So basically when you're doing drills, that kind of thing where your legs might sink, fins are gonna allow you to keep your speed up for that drill and keep your legs up for that drill so you can do it better. They're a training aid, not necessarily uh, a training tool. Does that make yeah. sense? Well, yeah. I mean, I'd also say that I think it's quite hard to kick badly with fins because if you have a terrible kick and you put fins on, it would make no difference. And it almost, you have to kick well or kick properly to be able to get the benefit from them. And you will find that your glutes are maybe sort of activated slightly more from it. Um, but yeah, it's all about sort of changing how you feel in the water with them. So um, 
yeah, that it's not going to change your muscles, but hopefully it's going to just sort of wake them up and, and get everything Make you working use the well. Muscles. Yeah, and it might slightly help with range of motion at your ankle if you've got very stiff ankles as well, because it's adding to the resistance and could help with a little bit of mobility around there as well. Well, staying in the swimming pool, we've got this next one from Verinda Singh. There's always get confused. One should release air through the mouth or nose, which is the ideal way. Now, it, when you swam for so long, you almost don't think about it. So I did actually have to stop and think about this one. And I definitely would say that it's mouth most of the time. However, when you're doing tumble turns, if you're at that stage, you'll definitely want to breathe out through your nose because if you're going upside down and you're not, you'll soon find out the hard way. That's I mean, what I do too. I, I pretty much only breathe out through my nose when I'm doing a tumble turn. I do a big blast up my nose to stop the water going up and the rest of the time, I breathe out through my mouth. One of the reasons they do suggest and some coaches do often say, breathe out through your nose is because they're trying to teach this what we call trickle breathing. And that is not breathing in out the water and then breathing all your air out straight away and holding your breath or holding your breath and then breathing all the air out straight away just before you take your next breath. You wanna be trickling the air out all the time. And it's far easier to control this trickle if you do it out through your nose. So they suggest that you think about your breathing and the best way to think about your breathing out slowly is to breathe out through your nose uh, but as Heather and I've just said now the rest actually do that yeah. so uh, and I think, you don't need to do it that I think way. to caveat that because if you were sprinting you're working really hard you'd struggle even with trickle breathing if you're breathing every two strokes that's a very short period of time to get on all that oxygen out and then get the next bit in so you you actually want to be able to do it as long as you can still control that and you've you've conscious enough that you can trickle when you're in a nice aerobic state and when you need to do it quickly, you can force it out faster. And also, you're always gonna be breathing in through your mouth, I'd hope, so it's just somehow easier to just keep it all the mouth and ignore the nose. I mean, some people use a nose clip, so that kind of really solves the problem for them. And it's, um, but yeah, we would, we would suggest that concentrate on the trickle breathing, but probably go towards mouth breathing. Okay, we've got two for one in this final question. Uh, Joel Zviv says, I know I need to keep one eye on the water, but I can't get myself to do this since either I do or I'm afraid I will get a mouthful of water. So instead my entire head comes up when I'm turning to the side. I know this is bad and that my hips and legs sink. I'm brand new to swimming at age 57. Welcome. Uh, any drills or suggestions I can work on to get me out of this poor habit? Thanks. And a similar question, Z Patel says, when I try and breathe without taking my head out the water, my mouth doesn't seem to clear the water. Is this due to a poor kick? Well, Breathing is one of the hardest parts of freestyle. Basically, it's the hardest part of swimming because uh, you can't just breathe whenever you want. You have to actually get your head out of the water, as Z Patel says, uh, before you can breathe. And that can be quite tricky if you don't have a great stroke or you're doing something slightly wrong. Uh, the issue both of these guys having is basically not getting their mouth to the, to the air at efficiently or in the right time. So one of the guys is lifting his head really high to get, to get uh, the air, and the other one is not lifting his mouth high enough to get to the air. And both of them are kind of corrected by the same thing, the same aspect of your swimming stroke, and that is your rotation. Yeah, I mean, the, just reiterating what James has said, saying that, is it my hips sinking? Well, your body is like a seesaw in the water. So if you're lifting your head, your hips are gonna sink. And no matter how hard you kick your legs, you're gonna struggle to maintain that. So. Obviously, you turn your head to the side to breathe, but you, it sounds like you're doing it and lifting. So if you can get the rotation aspect of your stroke, you're gonna to have to move your head a much smaller amount to actually reach that air pocket. So that's the real basis of where you need to work on. And then we also talk a little bit about finding that sort of bow wave at the front of your stroke. So, but it only works when you're swimming quick enough. So once you get to a certain speed, you'll have a bit of a bow wave at the front and where your head and your mouth is, the water just drops down ever so slightly. You can you won't need to turn your head so far. And that's when we talk about keeping one goggle in the water. So there's a couple of things and they kind of go hand in hand. Um, when it comes to the propulsion for practicing this, you could look at um, putting on some fins or something that's going to help you swim faster gives you more of a bow wave and therefore you don't have to turn as much and you start to get used to it and then also just working purely on actual rotation of your stroke and again fins are useful for drills fins with that. really help with the rotation if you put fins on you can control where your body is in the water a lot easier and how much you're rotating what you want to do is rotate your whole body to the side when you're breathing you're not, you don't want to turn your head or lift your head to get to the air you want to rotate your whole body so that you're face naturally comes out the water. If you do find, like Zee Patel, that your mouth is staying in the water on that apex of your rotation, uh, then turn your chin to the air. Don't lift your forehead to the air, if that makes any sense. You wanna turn your chin so that your mouth comes out the water without your whole head coming out the water. Uh, 
There are a few drills you can do. We have a few videos on the channel on how to do this, how to do the rotation drills, how to do side kick drills. Uh, single arm drills are also really good about for practicing this. Put some fins on, do some single arm where you do a single arm and then turn your head to the air, or turn your mouth to the air. Uh, these are very good at pra to practice this breathing and getting your mouth just out the water but not so far out the water that your feet are sinking. Uh, this is one of the critical things with freestyle swimming. So, mean, it's something that people struggle with the most but once you get it right you can then concentrate on all the other aspects of your stroke and you'll find it so much easier to basically spend hours in the water training when you're breathing efficiently. So it's definitely worthwhile spending some time maybe even spending some time with an actual coach to get this aspect of your swimming right. It's a very important part of your swimming. Yeah, well, good luck with that. And once you've cracked it, you will just be seeing the time drop off on your swim and it will be really satisfying. So keep at it. Um, a great selection of questions again from everyone. So thank you. Quite a lot of swimming heavy ones there at the end. I think came off the back of a couple of swim videos, which reminds me, you can leave your questions beneath this video or any other GTN video you see using that hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. If you've enjoyed it, give us a like. And remember, you can hit on that globe and subscribe. <laughs>